Good evening and welcome. I'm Matt Jacobs, director of the Bob Graham Center for Public Service here at the University of Florida. And it's my pleasure to welcome you to this evening's event. Here at the Bob Graham Center for Public Service, we are focused on helping our students to develop the skill sets and mindsets necessary for productive and successful civic engagement, public leadership, and public service. We pursue those objectives through our academic programs, our professional development opportunities, our research initiatives, our student groups, and as is the case this evening, through our public programs. Few issues demonstrate the very real necessity for those skill sets and mindsets more than the subject of tonight's talk. The crisis we face with gun violence in our schools is an issue that has touched Florida deeply and intimately, most recently in Parkland in 2018, but in no less than 18 different school and university related shootings across our state since 2000. And even for those students and schools who have not experienced gun violence directly, the very real threat of it is emphasized in the monthly Alice drills that take place in every public elementary, middle, and high school in our state. Tonight, we are honored to have UF alum and award-winning Washington Post journalist, John Woodrow Cox, to help us make sense of this issue. Moderating the conversation will be Chair of UF's Journalism Department, Professor Ted Spiker. Dr. Spiker is the author or co-author of more, more than 20 books, is a past winner of UF's Undergraduate Teacher of the Year Award, and regularly moderates conversations with distinguished guests of the university. It is my pleasure to welcome both Dr. Spiker and Mr. Cox, and I will turn it over to Dr. Spiker to formally introduce our speaker and take it from there. Thank you all for joining us, and I hope you enjoy this evening's conversation. Thanks so much, Dr. Jacobs, and thank you all for being, being here tonight. It is my pleasure to introduce you to John Woodrow Cox. John is a staff writer at the Washington Post. He was a finalist for the 2018 Pulitzer Prize in feature writing, has won Scripps Howard's Ernie Pyle Award for Human Interest Storytelling, the Dart Award for Excellence in Coverage of Trauma, and Columbia Journalism School's Meyer Mike Berger Award for Human Interest Reporting, among many other honors. He attended the University of Florida, where he finished as a national champion in writing in the Hearst Journalism Awards. He also currently serves on the Department of Journalism's Advisory Council, and now he is a book author of the critically acclaimed Children Under Fire, which is built off of his work at the Washington Post and tells the story about the impact of gun violence on the children who are affected by it. So tonight our format is going to be, uh, I'm going to ask some questions uh, about the book and, and, and the content of the book, and we'll veer into some journalism related questions um, as well. And of course, there's some times and areas where it's a blended world and they'll sort of all go together. So, so welcome, John. Thank you so much, so much for being here. Thank you so much. So, Delighted to be here. Have so my first, gator tie, by the way. Uh, yes, yeah, clear very about nice that. on Gator Day. Very, very nice. Um, so first, congratulations. It's just such Thanks, a man. powerful, amazing, um, compelling work of, of reporting and writing and, and storytelling. And it's gotten, it's gotten great feedback. The New York Times had a nice review, it, review of it. USA Today listed it as a book not to miss. And Dan Rather called it, quote, one of the most important books of the year. So, so yeah. I think we should just start with sort of the big picture. And somebody meets you and says, you know, what's going on? He's like, I wrote a book. And they say, well, what's it about? How do you sort of summarize you know, how do you summarize the book and, and capture the, the big themes of the book? Sure. I mean, the, the central idea was to give this really intimate account of uh, the impact of gun violence on kids in America. And the way, to, the way I really tried to do that was through kids' eyes. We hear a lot about school shootings, but we often, uh, or gun violence in general, but we often hear that from the adults. We hear that from the parents, or we hear it from the teachers or the police officers. Rarely do we actually hear children tell their own stories of trauma. And, you know, what I tried to deliver with this was uh, a bit of a wake-up call in terms of the scope of the crisis, that I think people look at it so narrowly in terms of who got shot, how many got shot. That's how we process school shootings. That's how we process mass shootings. People look at that bottom number, how many people died, and then they decide after that whether they're going to pay attention or not. And what I found from all these years of reporting is that the ripple effect of a shooting, even if it just lasts for a few seconds and maybe takes one life, for a child especially, is, uh, it can be permanent. I mean, these are, these are things that affect millions of children in America, not the, the hundreds or the thousands that we typically think about. 
Well, I remember when we talked about it very early in the process, you said this is really a, a public health issue. It's a public health yeah. crisis. You know, right. what did you what did you find in terms of the the numbers and the effect and, and how big this is? So, you know, a few a few big numbers that uh are really astonishing. So when I was still at the post, I launched off on a database trying to determine how many children had ex been exposed to gun violence on their campuses. This is K through 12 schools um, since Columbine. That number is up to 250,000. It's just short of a quarter million kids who have been exposed to gun violence on their campuses. A tiny fraction of those have actually died or been shot. But what I found in reporting the book is that you would see kids who maybe didn't even hear the gunshots and they were dealing with profound problems just because the shooting occurred on their campus. So that's really what motivated that. Uh, another pretty incredible number, um, again, you know, this is something I started off at the Post, was we, we set out to figure out how many kids had been through an actual lockdown, not a, not a lockdown drill, but an, a, a real lockdown. And in one school year, found that it was more than 4 million students in America had been through lockdowns. The number, real number is probably closer to 8 million. It's a massive percentage of the total number of kids who just go to school every year. And, and most of those lockdowns were caused by gun violence. And, you know, those kids have seen Parkland, right? They know what happened in Parkland. They know what happened in Sandy Hook. So when their school locks down and they go in the corner and hide and the lights get turned off, some of those kids think they're going to die in their school that day. So even though they don't, they're not free from the, uh, the crisis and they're not free from the trauma that comes with gun violence in this country. I mean, it's, it is an epidemic. So, you know, your book is very, you know, personal and intimate, as you, as you said, as it, as it focuses on um, the children. And we're gonna talk a little bit about the, the reporting aspect of that a little bit later, but, you know, for, for the people who haven't read the book yet, you, you center around two kids mostly, um, Ava right. and Ty. Um, can you tell us a little bit about their story and sort of why you uh, focused on, on them and their relationship? Sure. Uh, you know, to begin with, the idea of focusing on these two kids was uh, from kind of a 10,000 foot view. Neither of them got shot. I knew I wanted the book to be primarily about kids who were not physically wounded, who were not legally considered victims of anything to illustrate sort of this bigger point about the scope of the crisis. Their story is fascinating. They, um, back in early 2017, uh, I met Tyshawn uh, just a few days after his father was shot to death uh, in Washington, in Southeast DC. Middle of the day, he, somebody approached him in his car and shot him five times. Tyshawn was in school um, about a hundred yards away uh, from where his father was killed. Uh, his life just spiraled. I mean, he was angry and uh, obviously deeply sad. Um, it just really derailed him in, in every way. Uh, he lashed out and, and dealt with real depression. Uh, so I wrote a story about Tyshawn. This was in um, March, April of 2017. Shortly after that, I uh, traveled up to South Carolina uh, to work on a story about a school shooting in a little town there that nobody remembers because only one kid died. Uh, a, a teenager pulled up to this playground, opened fires on a group of first graders and, and kills one of them and then his gun jams. So I went up there to, to, to write about these four kids there and especially Ava, the one little girl. Uh, before I did that, she read, or her mother was reading a story about Tyshawn, the story that I had written. And uh, Ava noticed that her mom was getting emotional and Ava asked what was wrong. Ava assumed it was about herself because uh, Ava was dealing with a lot of issues and often caused a lot of pain uh, for her family. And her mother told her a little bit about Tyshawn and showed, uh, showed her a picture of him, a portrait um, that had run with the story. And Ava right away said, you know, he looks like he needs a friend. So she wrote him a letter, uh, basically just talking about who she was and that she likes chocolate ice cream and that she doesn't go to school anymore because something scary happened there. And then she just said, you know, will you be my pen pal? So they, the family sent that letter to me. And uh, after Tyshawn's story had run, I'd gotten a lot of mail for Tyshawn, a lot of people who wanted to help, including from uh, Chief Justice, or uh, the Supreme Court Justice, uh, Sonia Sotomayor. 
So I, one night deliver, I'm going to deliver all these things, right? And it's a really incredible thing to get a handwritten note from a, a Supreme Court justice. And Taishan just didn't care at all. I, I was trying to explain to him that this is a really incredible thing. All he cared about was that this little girl wanted to be his friend. And he read the letter and then ran up to his room and um, just scribbled out this letter back and, you know, says, uh, you know, I'm Tashan, I'm in second grade and I love you. Right. And, um, and it was illegible because he'd written so fast. He was so excited. So his mom made him write another one and he did. And, and that just started this incredible friendship. They have um, exchanged letters now for years. They, they FaceTime, they send each other gifts um, and they've just been a real support for each other and developed this very deep, and, and very real bond that is, uh, is, it's extraordinary because it's based entirely on tragedy. I and mean, that's what's so remarkable about it, so. I know this isn't your area of expertise, but you certainly know this subject, you know, better than anyone. I mean, is that the path to healing for these children? The, the sort of connections and bonds that, that, that can be formed between people who share similar experiences? I think it is for some kids, definitely. Yeah. For both of them, it was a realization that they weren't alone, right? It, you know, Tyshawn, uh, who, you know, was going to a school where he had to be pretty tough all the time. He had to kind of have this uh, toughness uh, or he'd be taken advantage of, or he would at least perceive that. Around Ava, that all went away. You know, he could just be himself. He could be funny and silly and, and he could also be vulnerable with her. And so could she. You know, and they would ask each other questions that adults might be too afraid to ask, like, why are you sad today? And they would just ask each other that. And so I think uh, for some kids, you know, sort of knowing what works for every kid is a little bit unique, but certainly for the two of them, neither, they're both at their best selves when they're talking to the other one. Certainly don't want to talk about all the different people, you know, in, in the book, but one that really struck me, I mean, it really hit me was the story of the Paxtons. Right. Um, yeah. And it's a little bit of a different situation, but it had such bigger sort of implications. Um, can you take us through their story? Give us sort of the big picture of their story. Sure. So uh, in the same county as the school shooting in South Carolina, um, not to the, the, that town was called Townville and uh, maybe 20 or 30 minutes away. I, I learned that a, a little boy had uh, taken his own life, an 11 year old named Tyler. Um, had shot himself. And uh, what happened was, uh, this was, he was an only child. Uh, he was beloved by his parents. I mean, he was really, their entire lives revolved around him. His mother had really struggled to get pregnant. And it was, it was you know, to them, it was really a miracle that they got um, pregnant at all. And uh, his dad had educated him on gun safety. Uh, there is this perception that you can kind of educate a child out of making a bad decision with a gun. And it's just totally untrue. And uh, one night uh, they had gotten Taco Bell and come home and, you know, Tyler went into his parents' bedroom and was playing with his mom's phone and came out and showed her this funny video on YouTube and then said, I'm gonna go watch cartoons. So he returned to their bedroom and uh, what he did is he knew where the key to the gun safe was. You know, this was not a gun that was left out. It wasn't in a drawer. It was in a gun safe, but Tyler knew where the gun safe key was. So he, he took the key off the top and he opened the door and he took the gun and he put it to his head and, and he pulled the trigger. And uh, his dad, who is an avid shooter, and was an avid shooter before this, um, didn't, it didn't register. He didn't understand what the shot was. He, it, didn't, it didn't occur to him that that could be a gunshot. So he rushes into the room and finds his son, who at that point was, was still alive, but uh, he, did not, uh, he didn't survive. And you know, they're haunted by that. I give that family, the Paxtons, uh, so much credit for sharing their story. And, and they shared it really so that people could uh, not do the same thing. I mean, that's really what it was. And, uh, you know, uh, yeah, it's a, it's a very sad story, but it's a story that happens literally every day that kids find guns uh, that they're not supposed to get a hold of and they shoot themselves, their siblings, their friends, their parents. It happens literally every day. So, you know, one of the things that we talk about, and I know we share this sort of value and we teach it and talk about it in journalism all the time is the power of the detail. And right. rather than sort of 
a lot of explanation and sort of going through this is what it's all about is one detail can say it all. And I'm just wondering if there was a detail for you that you saw or observed that sort of said, this is the entire story. Like, this is what it means. Was there, was there yeah, one that- The kicker actually was for me, the end of that story was the entire story. And that was the, uh, the police officer. This is, was, was a town, West Pelzer, this little bitty town in South Carolina. Uh, there were, I think, three officers in the entire town. So this, the, the, actually, it was the SRO at the school, the school resource officer who knew Tyler. He was the first officer on scene. And he walks into the bedroom and, and Tyler's dad is begging um, this officer to help. And he, he knows it's over. And uh, the way this, the chapter ends is uh, he buys a gun safe because uh, he would come home from work every day and he would hang his um, his gun belt, you know, either they put it on the floor or put it on a rack. And his kids his kids were right around Tyler's age, and he realized because he knew the kid that Tyler was. This was a good kid who was obedient, who did what he was told. And if Tyler could make that sort of decision, then he knew his could his kids could as well. So he bought a gun safe and locked up every weapon he owned and didn't tell anybody what the uh, what the code was. So that to me was. Because that was the whole idea, right? That was that it just showed like this is a guy who is a, a big believer in the Second Amendment, and he just realized that you cannot educate a kid out of that. And there was there was one other really fine detail that I will never uh, forget on that story. It was that and it was also from the officer when he went back to help clean up. Uh, he cleaned blood off of Tyler's baby shoes. Uh, and it's just one of those details that you will never forget because it's it just takes you right there and it's so devastating. Uh, so yeah, those those two especially uh, stick out to me. Yeah, that first one was the one that got me. I mean, I got chills when I yeah. read the ending of the, that chapter yeah. because not only was it powerful and vivid, it also sort of showed the point of like change through emotion, right? right? And right. Um, you know, it was such a powerful moment. And it, it, it sort of leads to my next question, which which is, you know, in the epilogue, you sort of break the form of the book, the, the, right. the narrative arc of the people who have experienced this and weigh in with some um, solutions that you think could, could work. Um, the New York Times actually said it was j- sort of jarring, right? That that, yeah. that came out of that came out of this book, and and um, I guess it's a twofold question. One, briefly, maybe summarize the solutions um, that that you see through your reporting, um, but two, the decision making to include that because your book is not a policy book, even though you stray, right. right? You stray into those areas. It's not a policy book, but you did hit it in the epilogue. So the decision and and the actual solutions. So the, the solutions were uh, three and, and they, what I did was um, cause I've researched this as much as almost anybody uh, alive uh, in terms of going through the studies and then doing my own uh, research, my own reporting, my own databases. And it was, you know, what does the evidence say will make a difference in kids' lives, right? And there were three pretty basic things. They're all really low hanging fruit. Uh, one is universal background checks would uh, upend the uh, trafficking, uh, gun trafficking in the United States and would, would save many, many kids like Tysh- or, uh, uh, kids' parents like Tyshawn's father. Uh, that gun in all likelihood was a trafficked gun. Um, so it won't save, so it won't save everybody, but it would make a meaningful uh, dent. Uh, another really obvious and uh, uh, solution supported by evidence is child access safety laws. And those are the laws that educate gun owners to say that, you know, hey, look, you can't talk your kid out of making a bad decision with a gun and mandates that they lock their guns up. And if, if someone is found to be negligent, then they can be criminally charged uh, as a result of that negligence if their, if their kid got the gun and shot someone else or themselves. And then the third is just a, a call for more research is that, you know, the CDC went for two decades because uh, uh, of a mandate from Congress and they didn't study gun violence at all, uh, nothing. So it set us back, um, you know, decades uh, just because we didn't, we weren't learning anything. It would be like not studying cancer. It would be like just not uh, developing vaccines for 20 years and just living with COVID. Uh, That's that's the equivalent. We've just decided we're gonna live with gun violence and do nothing to figure it out. The, the decision to do that was 
um, in part, you know, in conversation with my editor at, at the book publisher is that the, what we, the decision we made was, this is a devastating book. You know, people will come away from this desperate to do something. They, they will want to know, what can I do? What can we do societally to make a difference? And, you know, these weren't sort of partisan opinions. These were things that I could just say objectively, definitively, this will save lives, this will save lives, and this will save lives. So we thought that uh, we needed to leave some people with something uh, to say that, you know, from all these years of reporting on this subject, here are the things. It won't get us from 40,000 plus people a year to zero, but it could save 10,000 lives. And, and that's certainly worth it. Thank you. Um, yesterday, you tweeted that you've got plenty of uh, angry emails, right? Um, but I know you've also gotten a lot of supportive uh, feedback as well. Can you give us both sides of the spectrum? The What's the tone of the angry and what's the tone of the support? Sure. You know, it's probably 90-10, thankfully, that, you know, I would say 90% has been uh, totally positive and people who, you know, it's, it's, it's hard, I think, for people to look at the suffering that these kids have gone through and be um, sort of hardened about it or be coarse about it uh, because these kids you know, they don't understand policy. They didn't make any sort of decisions at all. They're, they're just victims. Um, there uh, maybe one in 10 have been uh, emails from gun owners who have been, I think, sort of conditioned to think that any kind of coverage of this issue is automatically a call for people to take their guns away. And it's a lie. It's a, it's a, it's a, a notion that has been really pushed by gun lobbyists to say that oh, any of this is just an attempt to take your guns away. People tweet this at me every day. They send me these emails saying, you just want to take my guns away. And this coverage just, want, you know, and nowhere in the book, literally nowhere in the book or anything I've ever written says that, you know, the Second Amendment should be abolished or that people, you know, law abiding gun owners should have their guns taken away. And what I found is that when you engage those gun owners in conversation, you'll find, as the polls show, that they actually consistently agree with people on the other side who say that, you know, they'll say, yeah, you know, actually, I do believe in a universal background checks because these are responsible people who would pass the background check. They believe in red flag laws that take guns from people who are threatening to kill themselves or other people. Uh, a lot of them believe in um, requiring licensing to own a gun, which is considered, you know, very far to the left. There is just this conditioning that we're so divided in this country on this issue, and it is not true. There is actually a lot of bipartisan support for the legislation and the laws that would make the biggest difference. Just people don't know that. Congress is split. It's not Americans. So we're going to bridge into some journalistic type of questions, obviously still related to, to the book. And just a quick quick note, we are going to take questions from um, the audience in about 15 or, or so minutes. So you should drop them into the Q&A. Um, as opposed to the chat, but drop them in and we'll get to as many questions as, as we can. So this is sort of related to what we were just talking about, John. We've talked a lot, you know, you, you and I have talked about sort of the role of a reporter, uh, right. bias, um, to how you be objective. You know, uh, when you write a book, there is a point of view. Um, yeah. You know, how, how did you navigate that element to um, your condition and your training as, as, a, as a reporter? Yeah, I should point out before I answer this question that uh, Ted Spiker edited the first, the very first piece of real long form that I ever wrote. And it was, a, I won't say what year it was because it was a long time ago, but uh, that's and you, really- And you thrive despite that. So that <laughs> it was, he's a brilliant editor, yeah. uh, truly, I mean that. Uh, uh, so that, you know, I am a very old school sort of reporter. I believe in fly on the wall, you know, let the reporting speak for itself. Um, that's what I believe in, right? Is, is uh, I am not somebody who uh, likes to weigh in a lot, no pine on Twitter. And uh, that's really not what I believe my role is. But on this issue, I also believe that I'm an authority. I think that I have, uh, you know, I've done so many years of reporting and I have done beyond just anecdotal reporting. You know, nobody had analyzed how many kids uh, were on campuses during school shootings before we did it. Uh, nobody had ever looked at how many people went through lockdowns. This was original, totally original reporting. Uh, and, you know, the research uh, sort of backs up those conclusions. That was, a, that was a hard thing to do. I mean, the book is written in first person. That was hard to do. 
But, you know, Ty and Ava, the only reason that they have a relationship is because I wrote, wrote stories about them. So, you know, my editors sort of had to get me around, come around to that idea that, you know, you have to write this in first person. That was not an easy thing to do. But I think it was a way, uh, an effective way, hopefully, to show people kind of what I was also dealing with and how I saw things in the moment when I was, you know, in those rooms with Tyshawn and Ava and some of these other kids. Well, I mean, that leads to really the big question of this whole, this whole book is that this is an incredibly sensitive topic. You're dealing yeah. with kids. How did you gain access? How did you gain trust? How did you sort of establish your ability to, to tell, this, tell these stories? You know, that takes a, a lot of work and a lot of time. You know, you, you always start with parents, right? You always try to explain to parents why you're doing what you're doing and what you're doing. You know, I always I always show parents previous stories that I've written so they can get a sense of what I've done. I'll tell them, you know, if they want to talk to parents who I've interviewed before, that they can do that. And then it's about just connecting with the kid. I mean, I, I am very clear with kids early on that I am not an authority figure in their lives. I'm always dealing with kids who have dealt with trauma, too. So uh, the goal is to never add trauma, right? Never, never add to their anguish. So I do a lot of work ahead of time. Uh, figuring out what their triggers are. You know, if there's things I shouldn't say, things I shouldn't bring up, I try to report around those kids as much as I possibly can. And then, you know, it's just about connecting. It's just about treating them like a peer, treating them like an equal. And when you do that, I found that the kids are actually pretty easy to report on, you know, and, and often it's just like, hey, tell me what you're interested in, right? Tell, you know, and what they want to do is they want to show you their toys, right? And they want to talk about the TV shows they like or their best friends at school, or they want to give you a tour of their room, you know, kids want to share. That's the thing too, is like, I think journalists, oftentimes it's just sort of too intimidating maybe to, to, to take on a kid who's really been through a lot of trauma. But I find if you can break through and connect, and if you understand the ground rules about where you shouldn't go when you need to back off, that it's, it's just, uh, it's so gratifying. You get so much out of that, that you might not ever get from an adult. I can think of one example that always comes to mind. The morning of Tyshawn's uh, father's funeral. Um, I was with him uh, that day and had been with him for several days leading up to that. And I'm in his room and uh, he's just getting dressed for uh, the funeral. He's putting on his vest and his clip on tie. And, and, um, and he just looks up and he says, you know, whoever invented guns needs to stop. You know, he wasn't saying that because the way he thought it would appear in the book right? He was saying that because that's exactly how he felt in that moment. You could never get that kind of detail from an adult because they understand the context of, oh, this is how it'll sound to a reader, right? I wouldn't even have written that quote down if it was said by an adult, but from a little boy who's about to go, you know, watch his father lowered into the ground, it was incredible. And I've had those sort of moments over and over and over with kids. I was, I was going to ask you, what was the hardest moment you had during the reporting? Was that it or was there something else? Uh, you know, that was, a, that was a really hard day. Um, I think the hardest moment uh, was watching Ava, uh, the little girl in South Carolina, have uh, an episode. Uh, so she deals with severe PTSD, is on a lot of medications. And while I was there, um, she had one of these really violent episodes. And she's a little girl who is adorable and um, kind and sweet. And, uh, and, you know, she just kind of turned into something else uh, in that moment. And, you know, her parents had to physically restrain her. This went on for half an hour, just uh, screaming and, and hitting and spitting. And, uh, and it was a really, really difficult thing uh, to witness. It was sort of so overwhelming that I had to, I couldn't really take notes. I mean, it was, it was just, um, you know, I was feeling, um, nauseated uh, really in the moment and and I filmed some of it and I recorded the whole thing and because I just knew I couldn't I couldn't take notes I mean I just couldn't sort of digest what I was seeing uh, I, you know I imagine this is a question that a lot of people you know deal with in the medical field or first responders but you know how do you separate the emotions um, of what you're experiencing and and being involved in these people's lives with with the job at, at hand? How do you, right. how do you cope with that? Well, you know, I think that you're doing a disservice as a reporter, if you um, kind of, during the course of reporting, if you, if you let your, 
sort of, if you let yourself become overcome, right? Overwhelmed by emotion, you're doing a disservice to the people you're writing about, right? They're not, they haven't let you into their lives to, uh, you know, be a therapist or to cry with them, right? They have, they have done this extraordinary thing and said, you can come tell our story so that you can tell their story, right? And, and to do that, you have to approach it professionally, you know? So the first thing I always tell people is how sorry I am uh, because of what they've gone through. Uh, and I can say there have been times when it has been hard to not shed a tear, but I fight really, really hard to not let that happen. And it's because I think I'm doing them a disservice, right? I think that I have a responsibility to observe and to take it in. And, and you know, I like to really, you know, bathe in people's anguish. I think that you have to, to then deliver it on the page, right? To deliver it to the reader. I think you have to really feel it but you have to maintain that balance all the time between being empathetic and sympathetic and telling them, being human, right? And saying how sorry you are for what they're going through and backing off when they need a moment. Uh, but I think it's really necessary to maintain that uh, professionalism. You know, it's hard uh, to bring it back. You know, it's hard when you, when you, you know, I live <laughs> in these stories and I live in this book for a long time and you don't really ever set it down uh, almost ever, um, you know, it's been especially difficult during the pandemic, uh, I think, to kind of check out in the way that I used to, my wife and I, also a gator, by the way, uh, used to, um, you know, take trips for a couple of weeks and just kind of, uh, you know, not look at the phone and, and really detach from all of this, not talk about it. And it was a bit of a reset, you know, the, the, the pandemic is, I think, for everybody, right, has just made that a lot more a lot more difficult. Um, so, but I feel like, you know, there are, there are burdens that come with this sort of reporting, but I also view it as a great privilege. Besides the obvious in, that in length, um, how is writing a book different from writing your long form stories for the post? Boy, uh, definitely the length, you know this, I don't know how you've written 20 plus books that astonishes me. Uh, but, uh, you know, structuring, I thought was a, a really tricky part is you don't, you know, with a 6,000 word story, it has a very definitive arc and, the, you know, beginning, middle and end, you kind of know where you're going and that's it, right? And with a book, you have to think about the, all that connective tissue, right? From one chapter to the next. So that it doesn't feel uh, sort of like a, a thing that um, is segmented. You want it to feel like one complete thought. And that was challenging because this wasn't just about Ava and Taishan, you know, the book goes into other aspects of gun violence and other kids' stories. So I did find that uh, to be challenging. I was, you know, very thankful that my uh, editor at The Post also editor, edited the book, Linda Robinson. She's a brilliant editor and is really good, especially at uh, structure. So we talked a great deal about how to structure this in a way that uh, would keep people going. I, speaking of structure, I think we share this as well because I've heard you say it that um, the ending comes first, right? right? Know where you're going before you know where to start. Did you know your ending of the book, or did you sort of take it chapter by chapter and many stories within? I, I knew it when I saw it. I knew it when I saw it. I mean, that moment. Um, I don't know if I should spoil it. Yeah, you don't have to say it, it but yeah. I'll, I'll tell sort of broadly. It's a conversation between Ava and Taishan, and there's this really poignant moment at the very end uh, that. The second I saw it, I knew it was the ending to the book. Uh, and that was a big relief because I can't even really start writing or thinking about it until I know what the ending is. And I had quite a bit of reporting to do after that. But, um, you know, that moment just so clearly uh, stuck out to me. And I think most chapters also were the same way. You know, I kind of knew where each chapter would end. And then before I started writing anything, I knew where each would end and each would begin so that I could sort of imagine in my head what it would look like. So I'll ask one more question and then we'll sort of, we'll open it up to the audience. So jump into the Q and A and um, let us, uh, let us know what you'd like to ask John and we'll get those, uh, those answered. So uh, curious about this one, the title, like there's a lot of time and energy spent on titles of yeah. uh, books. Um, was that your first thing? Was it your last thing? Was it a team decision? Well, what were some <laughs> other titles? I can take no credit. Uh, my uh, editor at the post, Linda, uh, came up with it. She suggested it. And I suggested it to the publisher and they immediately, the children under fire part, they yeah. immediately fell in love. And so it's a shockingly sort of easy process compared to 
I think what usually goes into uh, uh, coming up with a book title. I will say that the original uh, subtitle, so the full title of the book is Children Under Fire in American Crisis. The original was an American epidemic. And uh, back in April of last year, when we were really sort of in the heart of COVID, uh, I began to wonder, you know, we're in the middle of a pandemic, is, is epidemic the wrong word? Because we couldn't, you know, the, for those who don't know, certainly uh, Ted Spiker knows this, but it takes a long time. You make a lot of decisions very, very early in the book publishing world, the cover and all of that, and then it's locked in and that's the way it is. So, you know, I didn't know um, really how people would react to that. And I, I worried that, you know, that could really sort of um, be a, a, a little bit of a wrong tone. Uh, that word. However, today, President Biden called this an epidemic. Uh, so in retrospect, maybe it would have been fine, but we just decided that, you know, crisis was uh, an equally effective word. So went with that. I have to ask one more quick question. So sure. that led me to another question. So give us the pie chart of reporting, writing, revising, and promotion. Oh, that, yeah. How, how does that look in terms of the time and energy spent on each of those things? Yeah, so much reporting. I mean, there were just so much reporting. I mean, I basically lived in South Carolina for a long time. I was spending a lot of time at Tyshawn's home. And, and you know, I, when people ask me if I'm going to write another book, it's always the reporting that for me would sort of be the biggest deterrent. Taking on uh, sort of the mountain of reporting that I did for this um, and just the difficulty of it, right? This is just, this is just very heavy uh, reporting. And then, you know, I spent two or three weeks structuring, you know, I, I just structured and structured and structured and I had note cards everywhere and I had these sheets on the wall and uh, before I started any writing, because I really have to know uh, a roadmap, I have to have a roadmap before I, I set off. Uh, so, you know, the revising wasn't that heavy, actually, the first draft was, was pretty close to um, the final draft. Uh, so, you know, I would say 90% of the work was up there. Promotion has been uh, uh, a lot of work as well. I'm happy to do it though. I desperately want people to read this book. I hope everybody listening will, will buy it and share it with people. I believe so strongly in the message of this book and the importance that people sort of wake up to it. Uh, so I'm happy to do, this is I think my fifth um, conversation about the book today. So, uh, and my favorite by far. Uh, but, uh, you know, it's, 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 it's also an unusual thing to be doing it during a, a pandemic, right, where you're doing it all from a home office and not uh, in person with people. I very much wish I was there uh, looking out over a group of people uh, and with you right now. We do. We do, too. And we will get you here. We'll get you here soon. So our, our first question is from uh, Professor Cynthia Barnett, who is an esteemed faculty member, mm -hmm. or an environmental journalist in residence and, a, and an award winning author herself. Um, so she asks, can you address the rise of conspiracy theories that school shootings and other mass shootings are fake events? How widespread are these theories? How harmful are they? And do you see a correlation between the loss of local news or law? lost relationships between communities and local journalists and the spread of conspiracies? Yeah, that's such a great question. And, and I'll answer the last part first, absolutely. I mean, this is absolutely a product of uh, local news just uh, shriveling and you know, what has filled the void is people's Facebook pages and these uh, absurd websites that are you know, not based in any fact at all. You know, I, I've written about, um, I wrote last year about a family, uh, who, a Sandy Hook family, the little, their daughter was killed in Sandy Hook and their son survived. And this was a story that was focused partly on gun violence, but also just the, the stress on uh, a family like that going through the pandemic. And, you know, they have been dealing with this for years, being called actors and being harassed. You know, people have sent them mail. You know, they have to be very careful about where they live. These are people who've already gone through enormous amounts of pain. And now there's this added pain that they're be, being called liars. There's one little detail in that story about um, how the uh, little boy, Isaiah is his name, when he was around 10 years old, saw comments uh, below a speech that his mother had given calling her a liar. And he just began weeping, you know, and, and I dealt with it personally. I, I wrote uh, in 2017, I flew out to Las Vegas after the shooting there. 
and wrote about these six teenage girls who had all been there that day. Two of them got shot. And this woman uh, tweeted, I'll never forget it. She tweeted at me saying, you know, oh, I saw videos that prove this was uh, fake, that this was all made up. And, you know, I Googled this woman and she worked like a real, this was not a bot, right? This was a person who had a LinkedIn page who worked at a real place, who was a real human being. And I tweeted back at her and said, I saw their bullet wounds. You know, I saw the holes in their bodies from this. And, you know, she was like overwhelmed that somebody would respond because she just, I think, had gotten used to just sharing misinformation uh, and sort of the game of it. You know, we saw that culminate in January, uh, in January, right? The insurrection. That those are just, those were a bunch of people who believed in things that were totally untrue. And so much of it came, you know, piped through their computers because they didn't have a newspaper in their hometown showing up and saying, you know, this is vetted information and this is truth. So I, I do think that's a huge problem and will be ongoing. I don't really see right now a way to end it. Thank you. So this question comes from Mahdi. Um, in minority community where gun violence is prevalent, and trauma affects the whole area. Sufficient medical treatment for that trauma is lacking. Like Ava, many yeah. kids are suffering from mental health issues because of this problem. So what is the best way to provide access and resources for those kids to help them, specifically in minority communities? Yeah, what a, what a critical question. Uh, you know, we focus so much on school shootings and the big school shootings that happen in the white suburbs, but overwhelmingly gun violence affects children of color uh, many, many times more. And it is not individual incidents of uh, trauma. It is chronic. It is chronic. So it is kids hearing gunshots outside their door. It's seeing people get shot. It's hearing about friends and friends' parents dying. And that, you know, that shortened kids, that shortens their lifespans. They actually live less time because of that sort of chronic stress and that hypervigilance. It's the same thing that happens when, um, People who go to war come back, veterans come to war and they have that hypervigilance. Children in this country, millions of them are going through that right now. There was a, 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 one detail that I got from Philadelphia, a researcher in Philadelphia, who found that uh, kids would go into school and keep their backs to the wall the entire time. And when you would ask them why, they couldn't explain it. They had been conditioned that they had to face the world around them all the time, even in school, and this wasn't because of you know, some sort of lone wolf school shooter. This was because stray bullets kill people in those communities. So to answer the question, uh, you know, President Biden has uh, said he's going to invest $5 billion into um, community violence intervention. That's a good place to start. You know, I write about quite a bit in the book about the need for um, there to be more trauma-informed care at schools, because that's really the people who interact with these kids most of the time, 10, 12 hours a day. Teachers need to understand how to recognize trauma, that this isn't just a kid lashing out, that this is a kid who's really gone through something difficult and they need help. They don't need to be expelled. That movement is kind of just starting. Uh, and I know that too, it puts a lot of pressure on teachers to, you know, it's hard enough to be a teacher without also having to sort of get this trauma-informed uh, training. But we have to have it because, you know, what happens when a kid suffers uh, some sort of profound trauma as a result of gun violence when they're five or six or seven, that comes out 10 years later. And those kids often end up in prison or they end up dead. And there is an opportunity to intervene. You know, this is a country that spends gobs and gobs of money on all sorts of things. What's more important than our children? We need uh, access. Uh, that is um, cheap, that is not expensive. Tyshawn is a great example. His mother, you know, has a real job. She works for the federal government. She's not on Medicare. And because she's not on Medicare, she couldn't afford to get him therapy because of that. Uh, so, you know, he just hasn't gotten therapy because it hasn't been available to him. And it's outrageous. This is a kid who desperately needs support and care and someone to talk to, but it simply is not available to him. Thank you. And thank you for that question. Um, so hopefully we have a few journalism students out there. I think this question will be for them. This question, uh, John Cox, comes from one of your former professors, John Marvel. Ah. Tell us your thoughts about journalism education at the college level and what you took from UF that you still use today during your successful career. Yeah, that's a great question from John Marvel, who was another wonderful teacher of mine, along with uh, Mike Foley. I had, I had so many great uh, professors at UF. And 
you know, I can say honestly that, that Florida um, prepared me to go out and do the work. You know, the stories that I did with Marvel and Spiker and Foley and others um, actually prepared me to do the job. You know, I'm, I am a big believer in uh, not the theory of journalism, but the actual practice of journalism and, and having people who have done the job coming back and teaching people how to do the job. And, uh, you know, that's, I think for me, where so much of it came from, you know, we have to throw people into the fire a little bit, I think, when they're in college. That's why I, I love that UF offers so many different ways for people to get published, to get edited, to do real work, to go out there and do real interviews and real journalism. So many more, even than when I was there. It's, it's so expanded just beyond the alligator. There's, there's so many opportunities. So, you know, I think that it, it's, it's critical, obviously, that we teach people coming out so that they're prepared to jump into a newsroom and, you know, encourage them to get internships and these things and to build their clips package. And UF does uh, an incredible job. I would not be at the Washington Post. I wouldn't be a Pulitzer finalist. I wouldn't have written a book if I had not gone to the UFJ school and had the teachers that I had. I know that unequivocally because I started off as a really terrible writer. Uh, Foley likes to tell the story how I got, I think, a 46 on my first uh, paper in his class. I was not a good writer, uh, even though uh, my mother, though I will say, taught me English and how to structure sentences and grammar. And so I did have a, a leg up on uh, some people and I'm really thankful for that. Um, but you know, UF does a tremendous job and it's only gotten better. So you know, if you wanna go do this for a living, listen, listen to these people, they know what they're doing uh, for sure. So I'm, I couldn't be a bigger fan of the Jason. Yeah, I think 46 was a high for that class. So, you know. I felt pretty good about would, it, yeah, honestly. Sorry, <laughs> um, We do have time for a couple more questions. So if you wanna jump into the Q and A while we're waiting for, um, uh, well, actually there's another one in here. So this is from Alex. What actions do you hope readers in uh, specifically college students take after reading your book? You know, I think that uh, college kids, anybody can get involved. I mean, right, like Ava, I always use Ava as an example. She writes letters to um, lawmakers. You know, she wrote letters to President Trump saying, you know, what are you gonna do to keep kids safe? She wrote letters to Lindsey Graham and you know, anybody can choose. There's a lot of organizations certainly, and I'm not, you know, I'm not going to, sort of encourage anybody to, uh, uh, on a partisan side, I'm not gonna do that, but there are a lot of ways, whether you wanna go into journalism and cover these stories, these difficult stories, we need more journalists covering gun violence. I was at, a, uh, at the Columbia uh, J School at a, uh, a forum the other day where it was talking about gun violence coverage. We need more people who are willing to take on this subject. But there's a lot of other ways too. You know, there's at the community level, there's great organizations, these, uh, intervention organizations that need support, they need volunteers. And those are, those are the sort of groups that uh, they plugged into their communities. And when they know maybe there's an act of gang violence or something bubbling up, they intervene. Things like, you know, cure, cure violence uh, and those work. And that's partly what President Biden has, is gonna invest $5 billion into. So there's a lot of ways to help. And I think just awareness too, right? That, that this is a much bigger issue um, than people think. And then you know, sort of spreading that word and being willing to talk about it and not just ignore it, which so much of America is doing right now. You will like this question from Lucy Morgan. Ah, what did Lucy. you learn at the Tampa Bay Times? A legendary journalist, by the way, Lucy Morgan. Absolutely. You know, I learned so much at the Tampa Bay Times. My first job there, um, I worked for Mike Conrad, who uh, I'll say, uh, you know, is a man I loved. He hired me and he, he uh, died from COVID uh, last year. Um, I was a cops reporter there in a, a place called Hernando County, which some of you will know. Uh, I learned to write on deadline. You know, it was a thing that I really I learned. I learned to do enterprise on the side and uh, I learned how to really you know, a lot of narrative. I learned a lot of narrative techniques. There were so many great editors there at the time. Um, Mike Wilson and, and Kelly Benham French were both there. Uh, you know, it was a great place to grow up as a journalist. And the Times has put so many people in so many places. It was the St. Pete Times when I was there and when Lucy was there, I can say that. Um, but they've, you know, they've just fashioned, uh, and a lot of my colleagues at the Post actually have come from uh, 
from Tampa. So it was a, a great place and still is a great place. Uh, you know, does impactful journalism that, you know, wins blitzers uh, many, many, many years. So uh, yeah, it's, a, it's an amazing place. And I'm so proud to be an alum of that institution. Jeff Sermons, who is an excellent alum from UF, claims that he got a 47 on his reporting story, so ah. teach him by one. So <laughs> his question is, do you, do you have a recommendation for any gun safety organizations to consider joining? Uh, you know, I will say, you know, the, the groups that are, I think, making the biggest impact, I, I can sort of objectively uh, say that. Um, the Giffords organization uh, does incredible research. They, you know, they're not just uh, sort of doing the campaigning and the lobbying, they're actually doing really, really important uh, research. And a lot of, uh, often when I need a piece of data or something like that, they'll have it. Uh, Moms Demand is a group that has made an enormous difference. Uh, Shannon Watts, um, they have been very active and they're very politically active and, and you know, they're welcome, welcoming to anyone who wants to uh, participate. Um, you know, Brady, uh, is another group, Sandy Hook Promise. There's so many people who are, you know, doing uh, important work in this in this area. So um, Nancy asks, how would you recommend approaching this subject in your book when talking to people who are gun owners and might be worried? Yeah, I, you know, I talked to lots of gun owners uh, for this story. In fact, I really sought out gun owners because I thought, you know, those are the, those are the people who this book needs to reach, you know, uh, more than the people who already maybe agree uh, with some of its conclusions. So, you know, I found it really easy. I, I, you know, I grew up in the South. I grew up in the Florida panhandle and uh, I find it very easy to, to connect with people. You just have to treat them respectfully. I think that's just true of any story. I wrote you know, a story not that long ago where I was interviewing a lot of people uh, who believed a lot of what the insurrectionists believed. They watched uh, sort of those far right cable television shows that are frankly just mostly nonsense. And you approach them the same way, right? You just approach them respectfully. So many, many of the voices are people uh, in the book who are gun owners. And, um, you know, one of the main figures is a, a politician from the state of South Carolina who is a gun owner has always been as a big uh, fighter for the second amendment. And he kind of switched, switched his thinking after Parkland and said, hey, I think we, we need to uh, back gun reform. And, you know, I just, I, I believe that you can just treat anybody respectfully and they can sense that. And I find that most people want to talk. They want, they want somebody who's there to listen. And I think if you're just open to their point of view, even if they're wrong, maybe, uh, they can sense where, whether you care about what they have to say. I, I, a quick follow-up is I think the question was also sort of asking how we in the general public mm. can talk to our uh, groups of maybe people who have different yeah. opinions on it. How would somebody who has read your book and said, oh, that's a great, yes. I want to I talk to a gun owner about it. You know, how do I sort of approach that? Yes, that's a, uh, that's a great, uh, a great question. You know, I think finding common ground, uh, you know, what we talked about earlier, I get a lot of these angry emails from gun owners who think that, uh, you know, you're trying to take their guns away. Most gun owners, most responsible gun owners actually agree with most of the big sort of ideas being pushed by the gun reform side. 90% plus of Americans believe in universal background checks. So I think finding common ground to say, hey, what are your fears? Like, what is it that makes you reluctant about supporting any of these things. And then start with the data. You know, there's so much good research. Uh, yeah, one, maybe, I think maybe the most compelling research I found in, that I used in the entire book was, um, it was about parents who believed that their kids would not play with their guns. So it was a survey in the rural South where they would go to parents and say, does your kid know where your gun is? About 40% of the parents who said no were wrong because they interviewed the kids afterwards and the kids did know where the guns were. And then they asked the question, has your kid ever played with your gun? About a quarter of the kids who the parents had said, no, 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 they haven't done it. About a quarter of them said that they had in fact played with that gun. You know, that's data, right? There's no, there's no bias there. That's not coming from some sort of partisan group. If you start with that sort of good research and you try to find common ground to figure out what you agree on, I think you'll often find that you're not as far apart as you think if you just start with the basics, right? Throw out terms like gun control and get into specifics. 
Do they believe in protecting kids from getting access to guns? Most people do. Do they believe that somebody should get a background check before they buy a, a lethal weapon? Most of them do. So I think that's the way to start is sort of figure it, forget all the uh, rhetoric and just start with details and try to figure out what you agree on. That, that's great advice for a lot of topics. Thank you. Yeah. Um, one little last follow-up is uh, translations coming up in different languages. Do you have, has that happened yet? Is that oh, coming up? Do you know uh, they're going to I hope so. Okay. <laughs> I've heard, I know that my publisher is talking uh, to um, people all over the world and China and different places. Uh, that is certainly my hope. This is, uh, you know, it's obviously a, a crisis that's pretty specific to the United States, but um, I think a lot of people in other places are interested. And so uh, I hope so. And I'll be tweeting about it as soon as if that happens. <laughs> Well, I, I do want to thank the uh, audience for being here and their engagement. Um, absolutely thank the Bob Graham Center and the College of Journalism and Communications for hosting this event. Um, but mostly thank, thank you to you, John, um, and congratulations to you on just a, a powerful, amazing work. We're all so proud of the work you've done and the impact you've had on um, so many people through your words and, and reporting and, and writing. And it was uh, my absolute pleasure to talk to you this evening. And uh, I look forward to when we can share conversation in person soon. So thank yes. you all for coming. Um, thank you, John. And we'll see you soon. Thank you.